Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag. Here on this Sunday edition here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campia. I am the producer here at Collider Video. And joining me once again, of course, is Natasha Martinez. Natasha, thanks for being here. Of course. Thanks for having me. Excited and, for another show. Yes, clearly we uh, we uh, uh, are just we slept here. Uh, yeah. The whole crew slept here last yeah. night. We did not change clothes since yesterday. So that's the magic of uh, movie videos. Of course, <laughs> now, how do you get your mailbag question on one of our shows? It's real simple. Just email us at any time at collidervideo at gmail.com. Maybe you'll see your question pop up on the weekend mailbag shows. Maybe you'll even see it on the Monday through Friday movie talk show. Or maybe it won't pop up at all because we get an awful lot of questions sent in. But take a <laughs> chance and send in your question. So with all that out of the way, Natasha, let's get to the first question of the day. Caleb Lopez writes, my question is Stanley Kubrick is regarded as by many as the best director to touch a lens, but he has no Oscar. Why is that? As always, bring on the filthy. Yeah, you may not. I mean, not everybody will agree that Stanley Kubrick is like the greatest director of all time, but you will have a very difficult time finding anybody who will not say he is w not one of the greatest directors. He absolutely is one of the greatest. And as you mentioned in the letter, there are a lot of people out there, a lot of smart people uh, who think he may be the best, and he does not have an Academy Award. He doesn't have one. This is not a testament as to how good or bad Stanley Kubrick is. Stanley Kubrick was nominated for four times. Not a lot of directors can say that. Kubrick is nominated for four times for Academy Awards, but he never actually won. This is not a reflection on Stanley Kubrick. It is a reflection on how difficult it is to win an Academy Award. I've talked about this before. This is why I believe the Oscars are so valuable. And when people get one, they treasure it. Because, I mean, not all of them do, but they should. Most <laughs> of them do. Because not only to get an Academy Award, do you have to put in an artistic effort that is so Herculean, so amazing, it is the absolute best thing you have ever done. But you can do that, but there's no playing defense in the Academy Awards. You can't stop another person from doing something even better. So you gotta give like the performance, whether it's your performance as a writer or a cinematographer, as an actor or as a director, you have to put in the performance of a lifetime and then just sit and cross your fingers and hope somebody else that particular year didn't do just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned that Kubrick was nominated for four times, right? Listen to this, he was nominated for his film Barry Lyndon, which is amazing, right? He didn't win the Academy Award, though. Is there anybody who's going to suggest that Milo Foreman didn't deserve to win for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Is there anybody who's going to say that guy didn't deserve to win an Academy Award for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? It was just bad luck for Kubrick that he happened to be in the same year. He was also nominated, obviously, for 2001 A Space Odyssey. Unfortunately, it was the same year that Carol Reed directed Oliver. Is there anybody going to say that Carol Reed didn't deserve an Academy Award for Oliver? Now, you might be able to say, oh, no, it's close. Maybe Kubrick should have got whatever. But it's not as if that you're going to have an argument that, oh, clearly Reed didn't deserve the Oscar for Oliver. It was Oliver, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> um, Kubrick was also nominated for Dr. Strangelove. But uh, George Cougar also d directed My Fair Lady that year. Are we going to say that he didn't deserve an, uh, an Oscar for My Fair Lady? He did. And of course, Kubrick, a lot of people's favorite Kubrick film is The Clockwork Orange. Um, but that was the same year as The French Connection. Are we going to say that William didn't deserve an Academy Award for directing The French Connection? One of the greatest films of all time. So it just goes to show that a lot of it is bad luck. I mean, Martin Scorsese is another guy who up until The Departed, when he finally won Best Director for The Departed, he had been nominated a number of times, never won an Academy Award, because it was like this. Every year he was nominated, there was also another iconic, legendary film mm -hmm. that was also directed by somebody who directed out of their minds. Now look, maybe Kubrick is a better director when you sit back and look at his career than all these other guys who won the Academy, years, Academy Awards that year. But did they just happen to do a little bit better of a job that year? And that's what makes the Oscar so insanely difficult to get, why it is so competitive, and why you can get icons like a Stanley Kubrick, one of the greatest filmmakers ever to breathe air, not have one on his mantle. It's a, it's a frustrating thing, it's a tough thing, but it's part of what makes the Oscar so special. Yeah, and speaking of no Oscars, I mean, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh my gosh. Never won an Oscar, but 
When do you think it will be his time? Do you think with his new film, Revenant, coming out, do you think that will happen for him? You know him? what? I predicted in January, even though I hadn't seen a single picture, a single trailer, I just read about the movie, Revenant, mm -hmm. who his co-star was, Tom Hardy, uh, who his director was, Alejandro was his director in that, who just won Best Director last year for Birdman. And I said, I am predicting this is the year. This is the year that he's going to win it. And I don't think so anymore. Oh. I, I think he's going to be nominated. <laughs> yeah. But, oh gosh, what Michael Fassbender did in Jobs is crazy. And Jobs isn't even that great of a movie. Mm -hmm. But his performance in the movie is sick good. Like, so good. And... A lot of the critics, Paul Dano in Love and Mercy is also getting a lot of attention from a lot of the awards groups as well. I just don't, and we see Leo getting nominated in all these, like these smaller awards, Golden Globes, which the awards have been, but New York film critics, Boston film critics, Los Angeles film critics, all these smaller awards bodies have been given out their awards. And Leo's not getting a lot of the love so far, even though he's getting nominated. It might, this is going to be another one of those years for Leo, mm -hmm. where Leo does a tremendous job in a movie, but somebody else may have just come along who just for that year did a little bit better, whether that's a Paul Dano in Love and Mercy, whether that's a Michael Fassbender in uh, in Steve Jobs. Uh, and so I'm starting to think it looks unlikely like this is the year. But listen, <laughs> he's going to get one. Yes, like, absolutely. If you keep getting nominated every time you're in a movie and he deserves it. He's one of the best actors in the world today. One of these days, his performance will be the best that year and mm -hmm. he will get his due. It will come mm -hmm. and then he will party all the harder because he had to <laughs> wait so long. It'll make it all that more sweet for him when he finally gets it. Yes. I all right. Wait. What's next? Paul Achilles Dajjal writes, do you think Netflix's defenders once grouped and set would have a higher likelihood to be brought into the movie MCU? Um, into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's an interesting question. We talked about on Movie Talk the other day how uh, one of the directors of Captain America Civil War, the Russos, Anthony Russo, he talked about how, look, it's unlikely that you're going to see these Netflix characters cross over the movie worlds. They're run by different people. Mm -hmm. uh, they, Even though they say they're in the same universe and they'll make reference, I mean, the movies have never referenced the television shows, but but even though the television shows were referenced in movie universe, they operate totally on their own. Um there are no consequences from the movies that really happen in, in the Netflix shows. And he says, because those, they're run by totally different bodies, they tell their stories, we tell ours, it makes it very difficult to cross those over and to bring them together. Now, it's not impossible. It's absolutely not impossible. So do I think it will happen? No. But the way you phrase it in the question, once they're all grouped together, once you got Daredevil, uh, Cage, uh, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, once you got them all together and they're like the defenders, does that increase the chance? Here's what I think it does. I think it decreases the chance that you'll see them appear in somebody else's movie. But I think ever so slightly, I think it might increase the chance that they may get their own movie. But it's tough because why would people go and watch a Defenders movie if they can just watch them for free on TV yeah. tomorrow? I, I So it makes it difficult... Um, it's a tough situation, but do not count it out. It is not impossible. It looked impossible for Spider-Man for a long time. Took Sony going into bankruptcy almost to finally make it happen, but it happened. So it's not impossible. I just think it's unlikely. Would you personally want to see that happen? Right now, I don't know because two of these Netflix shows have come out so far. We've had Daredevil and we've had Jessica Jones. I loved Daredevil. Loved it. Um... I was not fond of Jessica Jones. Mm -hmm. I, I, now, but a lot of people love it. And so you got to take that in consideration. So right now, I kind of like them where they are. I like them on Netflix. I like seeing them tell their stories very slowly. Um, I don't know how well they do as a movie. If you had to suddenly tell your whole story in two hours, which is a movie thing, I don't know if they would translate as well. So my vote right now is keep them where they are. But obviously, if you had a Defenders movie coming out tomorrow, of course I would be in line at theaters to see it. So we'll see how it shakes out. All right, what's next? Christian Miller writes, Hi guys, I've recently discovered Collider and love the shows. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you, have you 
any idea what's happening with Jang Jimu's Great Wall starring Matt Damon. It seems a while since we last heard any production news or received any footage from the movie. Hero and House Flying Daggers are two of my favorite films of all time and certainly two of the most artistically beautiful and romantic. If you want to talk about artistically beautiful movies, to me, there has never, ever been a film shot that is more beautiful. I mean, every single frame of this movie is, is Hero. Hero uh, with Jet Li, one of the most gorgeous, no, it's the most gorgeous film you have ever seen. The use of color and the palette they used. Everything has such symmetry and beauty and art. Every frame is filled with artistic impression. It's incredible, the blues and the reds and the way they just use color. It's gorgeous. And you can pop that movie and fast forward, close your eyes and hit pause on any frame. And it's just gorgeous. House of Flying Daggers is another beautiful movie. Of course, so now there was a bit of a shake about nine or 10 months ago when it was announced that Matt Damon is actually going to China to shoot one of these movies with him. But what has gone under the radar is that Willem Dafoe is actually going to be in this movie as well. And Pedro Pascal, who played the Viper in Game of Thrones, uh, who met not such a wonderful ending at the hands of the mountain. But anyway, he's going to be in that movie as well. So Matt Damon, Willem Dafoe, Pedro Pascal, all in this movie being shot in China with this director has great potential. Unfortunately, since those announcements that came out like nine months ago, I have personally heard very, very little about any of the development or anything about that. I don't know if they started production. I don't know if they're even finished production at this point. Yeah. I do know this. I am looking forward to it and I cannot wait to see how it turns out. Absolutely. And I love that you kind of don't hear anything because then it's a secret and a surprise. Like nowadays with yep. all the leaks and everything happening, it's just like that precious moment of this beauty that's going to come out with this film. It's like so yeah, exciting. I don't want to see any, I don't want to see any production stills. Like, look, this isn't like Star Wars to me where I don't want to know anything. No, I'm not worried about spoilers, but I don't want to see the images. I, yeah. I want to see these images the way he shoots his images to be seen on the big screen. That's how I want to see them. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? Anthony Bird writes, hey guys, greetings from Ireland. Do you think you can get John Boyega to come on Jedi Cancel maybe after The Force Awakens considering he told Christian he is a fan? Thanks and keep on bringing that hot damn <laughs> filthy. <laughs> um, yeah, so if we talked about this on Jedi Council the other day, but uh, Christian went, because Christian does a little bit of work for Fandango on the side, and he went to cover the Star Wars press junket, which they didn't show us the movie for, but whatever. Uh, he went <laughs> to cover the press junket for Fandango and he sits down with John Boyega and the, the cameras start to roll, and John Boyega goes, goes I'm, I'm not going to try to do Boyega's English accent. <laughs> he just says, hey, I want to start off this interview. And Christian goes, okay. And he looks at Christian, I'm a big fan of movie talk, and I watch Jedi Council. Oh, no and way! So, That's of so course, exciting. Christian completely geeks out. The yeah. first thing, Christian comes out of that thing. He picks up his phone. He starts texting me, John Boyega says he watches movie talk, and he's a fan of Jedi Council. And he's all, we were all <laughs> really, really excited. Uh, of course, because he's in Star Wars. Yeah. And um, Christian told, told me, he asked Boyega, you got to come on Jedi Council. Mm -hmm. And Boyega said, not before the movie comes out, because I don't want to spoil anything, but he goes, I'm down. I'm totally down. So wow. we are working on it. Um, we really, really want him on Jedi Council, obviously. Obvi. Uh, and I think <laughs> it's right. We probably wouldn't even want to have him on until after we saw the movie so we can geek out with him. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, you know... I thought it was an interesting choice when they got John Boyega. I mean, the only thing I'd ever seen John in was Attack the Block. I hadn't seen him in anything else. And so I thought it was a really interesting choice. But as I've watched him over the past year, um, one of my favorite videos was when the Star Wars trailer dropped and the video of just him seeing it for the yeah. first time. And Daisy Ridley's too. Daisy Ridley yeah. put out a thing. I both was like, of them. how can you not fall in love with both of them? Like, it, it's, it's almost like to me, in the span of one minute, the two of them became America's sweethearts. Absolutely. You, I mean, you have to fall in love with them with those reactions. Oh, and I know. Like, They're so I happy. To cry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like, it was emotional, but joy and freaking yes. out. And, you know, seeing video behind the scenes video footage of John Boyega seeing the full scale model of the Millennium Falcon for the first time and walking up to it and seeing how blown away he was. Yeah. You just, and to have that guy on Jedi Council is so. We're working on it. Obviously, he can't guarantee anything. We can't guarantee anything, but we are working on it. We're going to try to make it happen, so stay tuned. So exciting. Okay, so now exciting. you guys have a lot of guests that always come in. Who has been, like, one of your faves? Um, wow. I think my favorite 
and, and this was like a, a team thing. You, we've Over the years, since we've been here at Clyder, since we're at AMC, we have had a lot of people come in the studio and we've had some just great, fun, wonderful people. But I gotta tell you, I think my favorite was this time that we had the head of Marvel Studios, Kevin Feige, Guardians of the Galaxy director, James Gunn, and star of Guardians of the Galaxy, Chris Pratt, came in the studio. Mm -hmm. And they were so fun. They were just, they were great. You'd think it would be something different, but they weren't. And uh, Chris Pratt was just really, you know, here's a great story about Chris Pratt. You might have heard me tell the story before, but, you know, I had Ann there with me the night that uh, Chris Pratt came in and he hung out with us and took one of our uh, uh, Samco shirts and the whole bit. And then I didn't see or talk to him for about three months, all right? Mm -hmm. And you gotta understand, Ann loves Chris Pratt. Oh, yeah. Like, leave me in a heartbeat oh, for Chris yeah. Pratt. <laughs> Um, Sorry, and who can blame her? I mean, I, it's understandable. I would, <laughs> like, I would I give her a pass. She's, that's a hall pass for her. I would okay. totally give her a hall pass okay. for that. But anyway, <laughs> so she lo and, and she loves uh, Anna Ferris as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're just both big fans of both of them. And Anne is like, we're both really big fans of Parks and Rec. And Anne is especially a fan of Parks and Rec. And of course, uh, Chris Pratt on that. So about two, two and a half months pass. And I go to another event and I'm going to be interviewing Chris Pratt once again for Guardians of the Galaxy. And I go in to meet with him, and he's like, John, I'm like, you know, which, which I'm always impressed when a celebrity will remember your name, not because celebrities are shallow, but because they see like a so hundred press a day. Yeah. You know, so I come and he goes, John, I'm like, wow, you remember? Blah, blah. He goes, um, how's, uh, and he paused for a second, and your wife, Anne, how's she doing? Oh my God, I bet she died. Holy crap. Oh, I, I would die. I finished <laughs> the interview with him, I stepped out, I immediately picked up my phone, and I texted to Ann. I said, Chris Pratt just asked, saw me, and without me telling him where your name is, he's like, oh how's your God. wife Ann doing, right? <laughs> so about three seconds later, in capital letters pop on my screen, WTF? <laughs> and then again, WTF? And then smiley face, smiley face, smiley face, WTF, WTF. So that's just the type of guy. So that was probably, I've had a lot of really great ones, yeah. but that was probably the most fun. That is so cool to hear that he's yeah. just like, oh, that's awesome. He's great. Makes All right, what's next? More. Okay, Eric Toombs writes, my questions revolve around David O. Russell's upcoming movie, Joy. The marketing suggests to me that the story isn't very strong because I still cannot tell what this movie is about at all. However, it will most likely get praise for the great performances by Jennifer Lawrence and Bradley Cooper, which reminds me of David O. Russell's last couple of films, Silver Linings Playbook and especially American Hustle, which I thought was grossly overrated but had great performances. Since Joy is bringing together the same team mostly, will Joy follow in that same path? Boring story, but somehow gets forgiven with great performances. Um, I think you're making a couple of assumptions there. I mean, look, I, I will be with you. I thought American Hustle was a little overrated. Mm -hmm. I do. It had some great performances in it, but I, I, I believe it got nominated for Best Picture. It got nominated for Best Picture, right, Dennis? Yeah. Um, and I honestly didn't. I thought it was a, it was a good film. I, th I enjoyed it. Solid film. Did not think it deserved an Academy Award nomination. Um, Silver Linings Playbook, though, I thought was a damn fine film. And, and One of my favorites. While, while I was like, no, it didn't deserve to win the Best Picture, I did feel it deserved to win or uh, be nominated for Best Picture. And I got to tell you, I did not find that movie boring. I was entertained by it. I had a good, I had a good time with it. And his film before that, Fighter, that he did with Christian Bale and Mark Wahlberg, not Fighter. Was it Fighter? Yeah, it's a Fighter. It is Fighter. I keep getting Fighter and Warrior mixed up. <laughs> um, Fighter was anything but boring. I, I thought Fighter was a magnificent film, which also I believe got nominated for Best uh, best Picture, won Christian Bale, his uh, one Academy Award right mm -hmm. now for uh, Best Supporting Actor in that. I thought it was just fantastic. Joy to me, I got to say, Joy has not caught my attention. Yeah. The trailers don't have me interested, but because I like what David O. Russell with this group of people have done, I'm interested. Now you say... You know, he's a boring director, but it's just, he's just going to notice because the actors give great performances. Remember what I always say about directors. The number one job of a director is not the visual effects. It's not the cinematography. It's not all the... Those are all important. The number one job of a director, to me at any rate, is getting the best performance out of your actors that you can possibly get. And when you look at his films and the performances he's... Remember, a lot of people thought Robert De Niro was just had kind of given up and was mailing it in. Robert Neer starts working with David O. Russell. He's getting awards nominations now, all of a mm -hmm. sudden. 
You know, there's a reason why Bradley Cooper got awards and nominations. And all of a sudden, after he worked with David O. Russell, Bradley Cooper's ga acting game went way up. And then, of course, you know, acting with a director like Clint Eastwood or, you know, all these other directors. Um, Jennifer Lawrence has just flat out said David O. Russell is her favorite director to work with because he brings the best out of her. And that's the most important job. So I agree. I thought American Hustle was a little bit overrated, but I still thought it was solid. I'm not thrilled with what I see from Joy. But you look at his other films in his in his filmography and the performance he gets out of his actors, I think David O. Russell is maybe not the best director in, in Hollywood today, maybe not even the top two or three, but he's got to be in that conversation about the like 10 best directors in the business today. Mm -hmm. And I really like him. Okay, and then bringing up, you know, the director's job being getting the best performance out of the actors, right. does that really take three movies or however many movies he's had <laughs> with this same cast to do? Because, I mean, I can't lie, when I saw the trailer for Joy, I had to do an eye roll because I was like, again? But, I mean, <laughs> how do you feel about that, like it's, using the same people? It's it's interesting because, you know, it's not just Jennifer Lawrence and Bradley Cooper. It's all, I mean, Robert De Niro's in there too yeah. and all, all that kind of stuff. It depends on the movie, I suppose, because, you know, that relationship, that that spark that you can get between a director and an actor that just brings something special out, whether it's Tim Burton loves working with um, uh, Johnny Depp, yeah. you know, uh, Martin Scorsese loved working with Robert De Niro and in the past 10 years or so loves working with uh, the aforementioned uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Yes. You know, when you find those relationships that really work, why not go back to them? Uh, with David O. Russell, he seems to have developed this little family that loves working yeah. together. And then look, it worked with Silver Linings Playbook. Then they all went on and did American Hustle together. It got nominated for Best Picture, more acting nominations for everybody. So they think, why don't we do it again? We're having a great time. We love working together. So let's see Joy. And if Joy is great, then we'll say, yeah, keep doing it. And if it's terrible, then go... Maybe the tank is run out of gas. Maybe try something else. Do you think there'll be an Oscar nomination for Joy simply because of, you know, the big names in there? No. No, I don't. I mean, a lot of the... Uh, now, I haven't seen Joy yet myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we have, were talking a little bit earlier about all the critical awards that have already been coming out. And Joy is not high on the list mm. anywhere. Um, so I have a feeling that... Not this time. That doesn't mean... It's, remember, you're going to get lots of movies that don't get nominated for Best Picture that are still very solid movies. Hopefully, Joy will be that, but I don't think we're going to see it nominated for Best Picture. All right. Cypher writes, straight to the point. How do you feel about directors going back to fabled franchises, more especially trilogies, after a prolonged period of time? I feel that after many years away from the franchise or character, the directors tend to lose touch, focus, and or the magic on what initially made it great and tarnish the perfection of what the original three films accomplished. With the exception of Mad Max Fury Road, the track record has been less than Stellar, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Lethal Weapon 4, and Shudders, the Star Wars prequels. <laughs> yeah, I got to look up here quickly. Um, Rocky 6. Uh, I just, I, I can't remember if Stallone directed Rocky 6. He did. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, Rocky 6, it was a long time. A lot of people forget how long it was between Rocky 5 and Rocky 6. Mm -hmm. Stallone came back, directed Rocky 6, and it was spectacular. I loved Rocky Six, um, and so that kind of goes against the grain. It, I mean, it depends. We haven't seen many examples though, of like yes, there was the Star Wars prequels that happened. There was uh, Indiana Jones, King of the Crystal Skull that happened, but we haven't really seen many examples. You mentioned Lethal Weapon Four. I love Le Lethal Weapon 4. I thought Lethal Weapon 4 was maybe the most fun out of the entire franchise. <laughs> and it introduced North America to Jet Li as well. So I really like that one. Um, so it's difficult to say because it's such a small sample size that we have. It's not like we've had 40 examples of directors leaving franchises and coming back 15 years later or 20 years later or 10 years later or 30 years later. It's a very, very small sample size. And when you have a sample size that small... It's very difficult, if not impossible, to give a generalization to it like it's stale when directors come back after that long. Well, I mean, hey, it worked for Rocky. It worked for Mad Max. So do we say, oh, no, it's great when it happens after that long? No, you mm -hmm. can't say that either. So I think we would need more examples before we can give any sort of definitive statement on it. Mm -hmm. Now, with the music industry, I mean, you always see these pop artists bringing back you know, popular songs yeah. of before. And so what I've kind of noticed is with these movie studios and producers and directors, 
is that I'm seeing a lot of, you know, remakes and, yep. you know, old stuff coming back. Do you feel that that's just like we've lost maybe any originality in anything or good storytelling, new characters? How do you feel? Well, see, the way I've always approached that question is, you know, there are, are there more remakes being made today than ever before in history? Yes. But there are also more original films being made today than any other time in history because there's more movies being produced today than any other time in history, which means a lot of them are remakes. But like, let's remember this too. We as a species, there are only so many stories to tell. And a lot of even some of the most original stories of the past 20 years have borrowed elements and are influenced by other stories that have come before it. Now, sometimes... If we have a great story, like say, there is no remake to Citizen Kane. Let's say there was. Someone's mm -hmm. going to remake. Citizen Kane is a great story. So why not tell that great story again? Especially if it's stories and movies that most of the current movie going audience hasn't seen yet. So, and let's not forget too, I mentioned this a lot too, is that some of the greatest movies are remakes. John Carpenter's The Thing. A lot of people forget that was a remake. Uh, Al Pacino's Scarface. That was a remake. Jeff Goldblum's The Fly. That was a remake. I mean, so you get a lot of crap, mm -hmm. but you'll get some diamonds, but that's the same as any movie at all. The creativity, I think, I almost think there's almost more creativity required to tell stories that have been told before in new and exciting ways that will appeal to an audience and a new generation. It takes a lot of creativity and a lot of originality to be able to do that. So yeah, I see it a little bit differently than most people do. All right, All right what's enough. next? Sean Bierbauer writes, Hi guys, I must admit the anticipation for The For Force Awakens has been as much fun as I could ever remember for any movie. Me too. With a Jedi Cancel and movie talk, you guys make it a lot of fun. Thank you. So what's going to happen after the movie comes out? I think speculation is, driving, is the driving force of all the fun. And after watching the movie, what are we going to guess about? Um... I probably hand in my resignation the day after I <laughs> We're see just it. done. Because I got nothing left to do. I mean, that, that's it. That's <laughs> nothing the, else to say. That's the peak of Everest <laughs> for me. It's like nowhere else to go but down. I'm going <laughs> to cash in everything I got and I'm going to go live in the Bahamas for the world. Yeah, I. That sounds pretty it's, good. It's hard to imagine, <laughs> but life is cyclical. I mean, it's. We always have these big moments in our life, whether it's, um, you know, a big professional moment, um, uh, winning Miss California, uh, mm -hmm. getting the girl that you've always wanted to get, uh, finishing that project you've been working on for five years. And it's always weird for us to think, what happens after that? Especially once it gets in sight of the yeah. finish. Like, like I, I've, I've got a novel I've been writing for years and years and years, and it's almost done. Um, I've been waiting for Star Wars for so long, and it's almost here. We had these professional goals. or Now, like, it's always weird for us to think, what's over that horizon? Because eventually we get to that horizon. And it's hard for, for us to picture what's beyond it. But with the movies we got to remember life keeps going because all this excitement and anticipation that we feel for the force awakens. Remember we had this for the Phantom Menace too, mm. and it came and it sucked, but <laughs> life kept moving. And one of the cool things about this era of being a star Wars fan is not only do we have this new movie coming, but even before when the star Wars movies were going on, the Phantom Menace was coming out. You had to wait three years until the next star Wars movie. And then three more years till the next. Now, as soon as The Phantom Menace is done, we only got one year left to wait until Rogue One comes out. Then after that, only five months until Episode 8 comes out. I mean, it is a crazy time to be a movie fan, crazy time to be a Star Wars fan. And, not just to mention that, after The Force Awakens comes out, I mean, hell, we've got Batman v Superman coming up. We got Captain America War Civil War coming out. We got, uh, we got X-Men Apocalypse coming out. We've got Finding Dory coming out. We've got, we get so many huge, exciting tentpole films coming out. And all the great indie films are coming out this year. Everything, life keeps rolling. So it will feel like we've hit that horizon once we see The Force Awakens. But then there's the next horizon after that, mm -hmm. and we just keep motoring. Good to know life continues after Star Wars. <laughs> life continues after Star Wars, as long as there's more Star Wars coming. As, right. Yes. Last question. Megan Hogan writes, what is your favorite film version of Scrooge A Christmas Carol? Love you guys and Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas to you, Megan. Um, Merry Christmas. You, I can, 
I have a hard time thinking of any version of The Christmas Carol that I can't watch. Mm -hmm. uh, even, whether it's The Muppets, whether it's Bill Murray doing Scrooge, mm -hmm. whether it's like a Michael Caine or wh whatever. But for me, and there's a nostalgia thing here for me personally, but the very first one I ever saw was, I believe it was the 1951 version, uh, Scrooge with Alastair Sim. That's the one my mom first introduced me to. That's the one my mom watched every year um, when I was growing up. She would watch that one every year. And so, like, I think George C. Scott played a really good Scrooge once, too, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But to me, the quintessential Scrooge is the 1951 Alistair Simpson. What's your favorite Christmas Carol incarnation you've seen? I mean, okay, I love Disney and I know it's cheesy, but it's a nostalgia thing for me as well. Um, you know, growing up with Mickey and Donald. So having um, that Disney rendition of A Christmas right. Carol with, uh, what's the what's the uncle's Scrooge name? Scrooge McDuck. Yeah, Scrooge yeah. McDuck and the little ducklings and everybody. That's that's my favorite. I gotta go with I actually that. have some friends of mine that that's their favorite yeah, as well. Yeah, it's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel just subscribe and click the thumbs up button to our video as well leave a comment jump into the comment section engage the debate and the discussion leave your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discussed here today i want to thank of course joining me today my co-host natasha martinez natasha where can people find you online you all can find me online on instagram at natasha a martinez and on twitter at natasha alexis underscore and of course, you can find me on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. I want to thank Dennis behind the scenes there, making everything run. And thank you to you guys. Next time you see me, I will have seen Star Wars The Force Awakens. You will be a changed man. I will be a different person. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye.